Good afternoon. My name is Wayne Robbins, and today I want to share a peek at the progress of cochlear implants with you, specifically in regards to candidacy, referral, and hearing preservation. I have no financial disclosures to make, and although it's not really a disclosure, I do want to let you know that today's discussion will really focus on adult implants and not pediatrics. I also want to let you know that I have a bias for cochlear products based on my training and experience. Advanced Bionics and Med-L have many great products. I'm just less familiar with them. So if you're interested in those products, you'll have to explore that on your own. The college has asked me to put my sources as the third slide, so here they are. I'll leave them up at the end if you have uh, specific uh, references that you'd like to look at or copy down. Objectives for today's talk are to know traditional candidacy criteria for cochlear implants, know when to make appropriate referrals for cochlear implant evaluation, understand factors that affect hearing preservation in cochlear implant surgery, and last, to understand the benefits of preserving residual hearing related to cochlear implant function. Cochlear implants have been termed the most successful neuroprosthesis to date, and there's been significant improvements in our cochlear implant results over the past 20 years. Candidacy criteria have expanded to allow patients with better more functional hearing to be implanted. And despite this, more than 60% of patients pursuing implants still have profound sensory neural hearing losses with less than 10% speech discrimination scores. People are still referred very late in the game for cochlear implants. We need to do a better job educating our local hearing health professionals and referring primary care physicians to make appropriate referrals. It is estimated that 38 million people in the United States have hearing loss and as many as 1.2 million have severe to profound losses. Yet we only have about 100,000 implanted in the United States. That's about 8.3% utilization. And although adult candidates vastly outnumber pediatric candidates, about 40% of our current implants are, are pediatrics. We've done a good job with pediatric implants. In the early 90s, it's hard to believe we were just beginning to talk about implanting children that was just 30 years ago. Estimates now show that more than 55% of pediatric candidates have in, been implanted, and some estimates are as high as 95%. Look at the rate of implants in children under six years old compared to the rate of implants in adults 65 years and older. It's not even on the same scale. This is likely due to the Early Hearing Detection and Intervention Act of 1999, this requires screening of children by one month of age for their hearing and diagnosis of their hearing loss by three months of age. But there is no EDI mandate for adults. In one study, only 37% of adults that identified themselves with hearing loss reported having an audiogram in the past two years. In addition, adults tend to underestimate their hearing loss. Dispensing audiologists are often unfamiliar with the changing candidacy criteria, and as a result, Adult referrals for implants are, are very underutilized. Improving implant referrals starts with us educating our primary care physicians to evaluate their patients and refer for hearing losses when appropriate. The Hearing Handicapped Inventory is available online and is a good screening tool for primary care physicians. It's also a great resource for your website. In one study of 500 patients that were involved in the Framingham Heart Study, the simple question, do you have a hearing problem now, was 77% sensitive to identify patients with a pure tone average of more than 40 decibels. And asking the questions more effective than checking a box on an intake form. Although I've never done any study of this, in my experience, the complaint, my wife mumbles, correlates highly with aidable hearing loss. And identifying aidable patients not only gets them into the system uh, where the progression of their hearing loss can be monitored, but amplification helps to preserve central auditory function. And preserving central auditory function is critical to the success of cochlear implants. Central auditory function starts to decline with moderate hearing losses in the 40 to 45 decibel range. There's even more significant decline of central function with losses from the severe to profound level, especially when amplification is not used. Simply wearing hearing aids can help preserve hearing and central auditory function. This loss of central auditory function really impacts the performance of cochlear implant 
patients after implant. Getting patients into hearing aids early is the first step in hearing preservation. This is the current FDA candidacy criteria for adults, but today there's even some non-traditional candidates that are being recognized and candidacy is expanding. Today, with traditional candidacy criteria, they require a moderate hearing loss in low frequencies with a severe to profound hearing loss in the mid to high frequencies. They have to have little or no benefit from hearing aids, and that's defined by the FDA as less than 60% correct in the best aided listening condition and less than 50% correct in the year to be implanted. Medicare raises the bar a little bit, requiring less than 40% discrimination score in the year to be implanted. Now, criteria vary a little bit based on manufacturer, and I've uh, put that at the bottom of this slide, but they're all pretty close to the same. And although the criteria are very specific, there's a lot of room for interpretation with the testing. Testing conditions are not specified by the FDA for the most part. Whether you use hint or AZ bio sentences or testing in monosyllabic words, some of this is now starting to be uh, required. The addition of background noise in testing significantly affects the discrimination. Uh, standard um, testing often adds plus 10 SNR or uh, some even use plus five. And what is the best dated condition? Is that just for the ear to being tested or is that for bilateral amplification? Several studies have demonstrated improved results for cochlear implant patients whose performance exceeded the traditional implant criteria. This is pushing the FDA to reassess candidacy criteria and to include patients that did not benefit from conventional amplification. With traditional cochlear implant candidates, most of us think of this type of audiogram where we just have a corner audiogram with hearing in the bottom left side of, of the audiogram. But there are has not been good correlation between standard audiograms and cochlear implant candidacy evaluations. Although a standard audiogram is part of the minimum speech test battery, we also use um, aided CNC words, NU6 words, usually at a 55 to 60 dB presentation level. And then AZ bio sentence testing that we do in quiet and in, in uh, plus 10 of noise often. With these severe to profound high frequency losses, discrimination, especially with background noise, tends to drop off significantly. Patients with borderline or better discrims on audiograms will often qualify for cochlear implants when tested in noise. And background noise is more like the world we live in, not the quiet of the soundproof booth. To help general and dispensing audiologists identify referral candidates, last year, Terry Zolan did a study uh, a regression analysis of, of uh, successful cochlear implant candidates uh, to look at their pure tone averages and discrimination scores. And she evaluated 250 patients that had been successfully referred for cochlear implants and found that 95% of the candidates had pure tone averages greater than 60 decibels in the unaided condition, and 92% had discrimination scores of less than 60 uh, percent in the unaided better ear. She calls this the 60-60 rule, and if we use this as a referral uh, criteria uh, off a standard audiogram, we get about a 96% detection rate for cochlear implant candidates. There is about a 34% false positive rate, but as any screening tool, we'd rather have a higher false positive rate than a false negative rate. Adult candidacy has changed very little in the years prior to 2014. The development of hybrid implants in 2014, though, has really stimulated development of new electrodes and surgical techniques that have pushed candidacy criteria forward. Cochlear now has an indication for children at nine months of age, and now many non-traditional candidates for single-sided deafness and asymmetric hearing loss, even for post-radiation after acoustic neuroma, um, have been uh, presented. I know Dr. Wilkinson is going to be speaking more about single-sided deafness and some of the non-traditional uh, indications in the next talk. But I want to talk more about hybrid implants as they've really provided uh, the stimulus to move the technology forward. Here are some examples of patients with significant hearing losses that will not likely meet traditional candidacy criteria, but they'll also not perform very well with amplification. The severe high frequency losses make it very difficult or impossible for patients to distinguish consonant sounds, and that results in very poor speech discrimination. 
amplification really does nothing to help improve function in these dead zones in the cochlea. Hybrid implants develop for just such candidates, patients that would not benefit from amplification, but yet had not achieved candidacy criteria for cochlear implant. Soft surgical technique developed to preserve residual low frequency hearing after implantation. This allows us to use acoustic stimulation of the low frequency and improves hearing in complex noise. This was really the start of the idea that we could implant patients and maintain usable hearing Prior to this, most implanted patients lost all their cochlear function. But now using short hybrid implants, we're able to provide electrical stimulation of the high frequencies only in combination with the acoustic stimulation. These expanded criteria allow us to implant patients with potentially healthier neural substrate. This opened many new areas of research like development of, of uh, processor algorithms and a combination of electric and acoustic stimulation. Hybrid implants are a significant change from the mid-90s when candidacy really required profound hearing loss with no discrimination score. And now we can implant people with hearing that's better than 60 decibels in the low frequencies above 500 and worse than 75 decibels in the high frequencies above 2000. They also should have speech discrimination scores between 10 and 60% in the ear to be implanted and uh, less than 80% in the opposite ear. It also requires a moderately severe to profound mid to high frequency hearing loss in the contralateral ear. Preserving low frequency hearing allows us to use traditional acoustic stimulation combined with electric stimulation of the high frequencies, electroacoustical stimulation or EAS. This provides advantages in complex listening environments such as background noise and music appreciation. It also provides a better overall quality to the sound. Carlson's study found that patients with residual low frequency hearing had significantly better postoperative speech perception performance even when the implant was used alone with no acoustic stimulation. Now up to a point, speech perception improves with deeper or longer electrode insertion. Although Gantz did find some degree of hearing preservation could be achieved in 90% of his patients, right, uh, results vary a lot depending on studies. As early as 2004, we see studies reporting significant success with hearing preservation after implantation. Gastoner, in this study of 21 implanted patients, was able to preserve hearing within 10 decibels in 62% of his patients. He preserved low frequency hearing in 87%, but lost all hearing in about 14. The downside is the hearing is not always able to be preserved. Using short electrodes, about 5% fail initial attempts at hearing preservation. This, of course, will be worse with traditional or longer electrodes. 10% lose their residual hearing by the three-month checkup. In addition, implantation doesn't stop a progressive hearing loss. In fact, the rate of progression seems to be faster after a year has been implanted. If all residual hearing is lost using a short or hybrid uh, electrode, Reimplantation can be performed with traditional electrode to achieve improvement in speech understanding and speech discrimination scores. Initial success with, the, with these hybrid implants has focused research in new areas like studies of electrode design and improvement in soft surgical techniques. In terms of electrode design, in general, longer electrodes with deeper insertions give better hearing results and speech perception results when cochlear implant is used alone. And in the event that there's a total loss of residual hearing, the results are significantly better with the longer electrodes than they are with the shorter electrodes. Unfortunately, the deeper insertion is more often correlated with loss of residual hearing. And even when hearing is preserved, hearing loss tends to increase at a faster rate after implantation. In 2015, Friedman compared hearing preservation with the 16 millimeter hybrid L24 and found a 70% hearing preservation rate compared to the traditional uh, longer electrode, the 422 slim straight, where he achieved a 42% uh, hearing preservation rate. For short electrodes in the literature, less than 20 millimeters of active length, hearing preservation rates vary from about 54 to 88%. 
For standard lateral wall electrodes, um, often more than 20 millimeters, hearing preservation rates vary from about 11 to 77 percent. So the benefits of increased chances of hearing preservation have to be weighed against the evidence that increased cochlear coverage tends to better speech recognition scores. Evolution of electrode design has been driven by three key principles. Initially, multi-channel stimulation for better discrimination. More recently, placing electrodes closer to the target for high spatial specificity. Uh, electrodes like the Contour Advance, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Currently, there's been emphasis more on the design for atraumatic placement into the scale of tympani to preserve the fine cochlear anatomy. In the past, with larger cochleostomies and larger straight electrodes, implantation meant the loss of all cochlear function. Now electrode design and selection has become a key component to hearing preservation. Lateral wall electrodes more reliably stay in the scale of tympani in the basal return insertions, but deeper insertion uh, risks translocation into the scale or vestibuli and loss of natural cochlear function. As you can see in this graphic, implant design seems to be focusing around on this 20 millimeter um, length as, uh, as the standard. 20 millimeters often correlates with a 360 degree or uh, complete basal return insertion for most patients. This seems to be ideal for, um, for the lateral wall electrodes. Medell is even developing software to help analyze this CAT scan and estimate the ideal implant length for any given patient. Another aspect of uh, electrode design is the perimedialar versus straight electrode. Currently, we can think of implant surgery with two different primary goals. When hearing preservation is not a consideration due to profound hearing loss, preservation of the structure and integrity of the cochlea for optimal electrical stimulation becomes our focus. So the perimedialar electrodes are less traumatic with these deeper insertions, and they place the active electrode in close proximity to the, sp the spiral ganglia. This provides greater neural specificity. The alternative goal is when there is residual hearing and we wanna preserve that. Preservation of functional hearing for acoustic amplification becomes our focus and using the electric supplementation for high frequencies for, the, for discrimination. Lateral wall electrodes are thinner, more flexible, and in the basal or turn insertions, they uh, remain fa fairly atraumatic. This coronal section through the cochlea demonstrates these characteristics. The slim straight electrode, the 422, tends to hug the lateral wall of the scale, as you can see in this uh, slide. Note that there is narrower dimensions of um, the scale as we get out lateral like this, and it puts the electrode in proximity to the spiral ligament and the basilar membrane. The contour advance, this perimedialar electrode on the other hand, you can see stays tight against the medialis in close proximity to the spiral ganglion, where the scale is actually a little larger, a little more spacious, and it keeps it away from some of the um, fine um, ultrastructure of the cochlea. Changes in design of the electrode help to provide more flexibility and allow the electrode to track in the scale of tympani during insertion. Unpaired apical electrodes create a softer, more flexible tip to allow it to track, while an oval diameter provides a better apical flexibility. Half-banded electrodes have replaced full-banded electrodes to allow a thinner diameter to the uh, electrode in general. These thinner, more flexible electrodes allow us to use round window insertion techniques where the electrode has to navigate through the hook region as it's entering the scala. This graphic shows the evolution of cochlear's electrodes. The original was the N24, which was a straight electrode and made for deep insertion. It was fairly thick and had uh, full electrodes on it. Then went to the Contour Advance, which was this perimedialar electrode, which was uh, used a stylet to allow for insertion, but got a full one and a half turn insertion. As hearing preservation became important, they switched to the lateral wall type of electrode, uh, the hybrid being the first and the thin um, flexible type of a lateral wall electrode. This was then extended in length to the slim straight 422, which is 20 uh, to 25 millimeters and allows a full basal turn insertion. Now they've developed a 632 slim medialar electrode, which takes the stylet away and uses an introducer for insertion. 
This has allowed a pre-curved perimedialar implant with the diameter and flexibility of, lateral, of the lateral wall electrodes. And they've also working or developed a 624, which is a 20 millimeter version of the slim straight lateral wall electrode. Well, it's not all about electrodes. Soft surgical technique has also been evolving as a significant part of hearing preservation. The key components are electrode selection, and we've already talked about that, uh, providing a minimally invasive surgery, using suitable route of insertion, insertion techniques, and controlling inflammatory responses, primarily with steroids. Let's look at each. The first component of soft surgical technique is to perform a minimally invasive surgery. This starts by minimizing mechanical damage to the cochlea, and we've already spoken about the choice of electrode but using, uh, this does affect the cochleostomy that we choose. Using thinner electrodes means smaller cochleostomies and likely less drilling and trauma to the cochlea. Placing the cochleostomy in the correct position provides better access into the scale of tympani, and this minimizes trauma to the osseous spiral lamina and spiral ligament. We, of course, want to avoid manipulation of the um, ossicles, either with the drill or accidentally with the implant uh, during implantation. We want to minimize shock waves in the perilymph, and this means minimizing drilling in general, but specifically in drilling around the cochleostomy. So we'd like to avoid drilling on the endosteum, so we just flatten out the bony promontory until we expose periosteum, and then finally pick that away with a small angle pick. Slow insertion of the electrode over about a one to two minute period has been correlated with um, improved speech preservation rates. So to minimize acoustic trauma, again, means trying to uh, minimize drilling and no unnecessary drilling. We'd like to avoid loss of perilymph, so no suctioning around the cochleostomy or the open round window. And we also seal the open um, round window with fascia, typically, once the implant is completed. Blood and bone in the scale is, uh, is quite irritative and can be toxic. Uh, so we like to uh, be sure that we irrigate completely and remove all bone dust and obtain good hemostasis before we open the round window or the cochleostomy site. There is no clear consensus on which approach provides better results with hearing preservation, cochleostomy versus round window insertions. Haveneth in 2013 published a systematic review and found that levels of hearing preservation between the two approaches were similar. There are advantages to both uh, approaches Cochleostomy provides a more direct access to the scale of tympani, so it's better with thicker, stiffer electrodes like the Contour Advance, but this does risk cochlear damage due to drilling on periosteum. Round window is technically more simple, but it does require the use of the more flexible electrodes due to the angle of insertion. Adunka published an article in 2004 showing better results with round window insertion versus cochleostomy, and he felt this resulted in less perilymph loss, uh, less uh, bone formation in the cochlea, and less trauma caused by drilling. Many other studies refute this, though, showing no advantage to either approach. Having done both, I can tell you, uh, for me, the round window insertion is significantly less traumatic, very straightforward. Insertion technique is all about insertion forces. Insertion force equals cochlear trauma and anything you can do to decrease insertion force will benefit hearing preservation. Lubricating the electrode with helon or hyaluronic acid has been beneficial. However, gross introduction of hyaluronic acid into the scala can have cytotoxic effects. Some have been using steroids to lubricate the implant, and this is shown to help reduce some of the inflammatory reaction within the scala. Insertion force of lateral wall electrodes starts as the electrode approaches the 180 degree mark where it starts to contact the lateral wall. An insertion past the 360 degree mark, the scala begins to narrow and you can get buckling of the electrode in the basal or turn as you push it forward. This dramatically increases the insertion forces. If we continue on into a full insertion at one and a half turns, we are risking damage to the cochlea due to this high insertion force. Perimedialar electrodes, on the other hand, avoid this issue as they never really start to contact the lateral wall. Initially, there's some increase in insertion forces as they 
uh, start to take their shape. But once they achieve their perimedialar position, we can get full insertion with minimal insertion forces. Slow steady insertion helps to reduce perilymph loss and is recommended that we uh, implant over uh, one to two minutes. Control of the inflammatory response is all about using steroids and steroid administration with implantation has been studied in multiple different ways, uh, systemic oral, uh, both preoperatively and postoperatively using um, uh, topical uh, steroids on the implant itself, using intratympanic steroids preoperatively. There's been studies of sustained release dexamethasone um, hydrogels being implanted at the time of surgery as well. More recently, there's been research into drug eluting implants, and that shows some promise possibly for the future. But let's just say many guinea pigs have given their lives in search of the best route and dose of steroid administration for the implants. And although they all show promise, there's not one specific recommendation in the literature at this point. When steroids are applied topically, it typically reaches a peak concentration within about an hour, and this lasts less than about 24 hours. Now, fibrosis occurs along the implant as a foreign body reaction, so fibrosis limits the vibration of the apical basilar membrane and impairs low frequency hearing. The aim of the postoperative steroids are to prevent against long-term fibrosis and intracochlear cell death. So there's several studies like Chow's study using dexamethasone systemically that was given preoperatively and then used topically in the OR. And this of course showed statistically significant differences in pure tone average um, after one year um, ap testing after one year from the surgery. Sweeney studied the use of oral prednisone, um, which was given in a tapered dose starting three days preoperatively and carried on for two weeks postoperatively. And they showed significant improvement in the rate and degree of hearing preservation as measured at implant activation. Probably there's minimal effect from topical or one intraoperative dose, and the longer term effects of systemic pre and post-op steroids seems to make more sense to me. But again, there's not a real clear consensus um, or recommendation at this point. There are many studies demonstrating the results of electroacoustic stimulation and the benefits of hearing preservation in the literature. Most show significant improvements in discrimination, both in quiet and in noise. Several studies do show patients dropping out of acoustic uh, stimulation for complete electric stimulation for a variety of reasons, but often including the comfort of the acoustic uh, fitting. This study by Usami in 2014 is representative. Each of these graphs shows a preoperative uh, result, as well as acoustic stimulation alone, electric stimulation alone, or these dark bars of electroacoustic stimulation together. EAS, the dark bars, improves discrimination over acoustic or electric stimulation alone in all of these conditions. Monosyllabic words and noise improve from about 20% preoperative to about 60% postoperatively. And sentences improved from about 50% preoperatively to almost 90% postoperatively. These are significant improvements and add a lot to a patient's ability to communicate as well as to their quality of life. This study evaluates how much background noise is needed to drop the discrimination score to 50%, a measure of how well patients do with their implants in background noise. Now signal to noise ratio is positive when the signal, what you're trying to hear, is louder than the noise. So plus 10, for example, the signal would be 10 decibels louder than the noise. It's negative when the noise is louder than the signal by say four or six decibels. The long implants are the white bars and tend to cluster around the plus two mark. The hybrid implants are the dark bars and tend to cluster around the minus two to minus four. This shows that patients with electroacoustic stimulation, hybrid implants, maintain good discrimination with significantly more, insignificantly more background noise than patients that use traditional implants. So in summary, cochlear implants in adults are, have remained underused, and candidacy criteria has expanded, allowing options for some non-traditional candidates. We talked about the 60-60 rule that can be used to identify referral candidates from standard audiograms. 
We also discussed the improvements in electrode design, which provides options to individualize patient outcomes for residual hearing. Soft surgical techniques continue to evolve and allow uh, preservation of more natural hearing. And hearing preservation allows for electroacoustic stimulation, which improves hearing in complex noise, especially in background for the noisy world that we live in. Well, thank you for listening to this presentation today. I hope I've given you some insights into uh, the progress, or some of the progress of cochlear implants. These are my sources and I'll leave these up uh, Appreciate the opportunity to present today.